Right, so hopefully you didn't take too much of a break in between so we don't have to recap the, uh, the first third of chapter 12. We are the fourth line from the bottom on page 215. Harry has one parcel left and he picks it up and feels it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery grey went slithering to the floor where it, lay in, where it lay in gleaming folds. Ron gasped. As I said, because I've never read this chapter before, when I am reading a new book, I do a lot of rereading. It sounds very much different in my head. Reading aloud is very different, but I still always do that rereading because otherwise I won't understand. And the listener, you guys, you might not understand if I'm just continuing on after I've made mistakes. So it went slithering to the floor where it lay in gleaming folds. Ron gasped. Now my first thought was it was a snake and Ron's gasp is shock, fear, horror. I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice, dropping the box of every flavour beans he'd got from Hermione. If that's what I think it is, they're really rare. They're really valuable. What is it? Harry picked the shining silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to touch, like water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron, a look of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Now think about the fact if they're very rare and very valuable, something Ron's family could never afford to buy. Harry threw the cloak around his shoulders and Ron gave a yell. It is! Look down! Harry looked down at his feet, but they had gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him. Just his head suspended in mid-air, his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled off the cloak and seized the letter. Written in narrow, loopy writing he had never seen before were the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it very well. A very merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Ron was admiring the cloak. I'd give anything for one of these, he said. Anything! What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who had sent the cloak? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say or think anything else, the dormitory door was flung open and Fred and George Weasley bounded in. Harry stuffed the cloak quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else. And I could only imagine what Fred and George would get up to because we already know they are cheeky, mischievous troublemakers. So imagine what they would get up to with the cloak. Merry Christmas! Hey look, Harry's got a Weasley jumper too! Fred and George were wearing blue jumpers one with a large yellow F on it and the other with a ye large yellow G. Harry's is better than ours though, said Fred, holding up Harry's jumper. She obviously makes more of an effort if you're not family. Why aren't you wearing yours, Ron? George demanded. Come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. I hate maroon. Ron moaned half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. You haven't got a letter on yours, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name, but we're not stupid. We know we're called Gred and Forge. See, I told you they were cheeky. What's all this noise? Percy Weasley stuck his head through the door, looking disapproving. He had clearly come halfway through, unwrapping his presents as he too carried a lumpy jumper over his arm, which Fred seized. P for Prefect, get it on, Percy, come on. We're all wearing ours, even Harry got one. I don't want, said Percy thickly, as the twins forced the jumper over his head knocking his glasses askew. So what do you think Percy thinks of his gift? And you're not sitting with the prefix today either, said George. Christmas time is for family. They frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to his sides by his jumper. Harry had never in all of his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of fat chipolatas, which I'm pretty sure are a type of sausage, terrines or butter, uh, terrines of buttered peas. So the terrine, I imagine, is a container. So this is me working out the vocabulary that I'm reading, trying to piece everything together and make connections so it makes sense. Silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce 
and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic crackers were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually bought with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats. Right, when I first read crackers, I was thinking dry biscuits. So I've now worked out crackers are bonbons because I'm not sure what your family uses, but we say bonbons. And I know the majority of Australia, it's always packaged as bonbons. Um, so they had little plastic toys with their flimsy paper hats. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with Fred and it didn't just bang. It went off like a blast, like a cannon, and engulfed them all in a cloud of blue smoke. Or from the inside exploded a rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up on the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointed wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming Christmas puddings followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. So think back, see if you can remember what a sickle is. Harry watched Hagrid getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine. <gasps> Finally kissing Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed. Her top hat lopsided. When Harry finally left the table, he was laden down with a stack of things out of the crackers, including a pack of non-explodable luminous balloons, a grow-your-own-warts kit, and his own new wizard chess set. The white mice had disappeared and Harry had nasty feelings they were going to end up as Mrs. Norris's Christmas dinner. So once again, think back to who Mrs. Norris is. Otherwise, if you're thinking it's a human, I don't want to think about them eating mice. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon having a furious snowball fight in the grounds. Then, cold, wet and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chess set by losing spectacularly, spectacular, spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost it so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a tea of turkey sandwiches, crumpets, trifle and Christmas cake, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed except to sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over Gryffindor Tower because they'd stolen his prefect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging at the back of his mind all day. What is it? What's nagging at his mind? Not until he climbed into bed was he free to think about it. The invisibility cloak and whoever had sent it. So remember when you make a prediction, when you find out if you're right, you make a new prediction. If you find out if your prediction is incorrect, you then reassess and then you change your prediction. Ron, full of turkey and cake and with nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains of his four-poster bed. Harry leant over the side of his own bed and pulled the cloak out from under it. His father's, this had been his father's. He let the material flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well, the note had said. He had to try it, now. He slipped out of bed and wrapped the cloak around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It was a very funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake. The whole of Hogwarts was open to him in this cloak. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in this, anywhere, and Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him back. His father's cloak. He felt that this time, the first time, he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory down the stairs, across the common room, and climbed through the portrait hole. Who's there? squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing and thought. And then it came to him. The restricted section in the library. He'd, been, he'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took him to find out who Flammel was. He set off, drawing the invisibility cloak tight around him as he walked. What would be the first thing that you would do if you had an invisibility cloak? Have a think. How many of you were, um, has, tr 
How many of you have chosen that you would go to a library as your first task in an invisibility cloak? I imagine I can work out the percentage of you that would have chosen that. The library was pitch black and very eerie. Harry lit a lamp to see his way along the rows of books. The lamp looked as if it was floating along in midair, and even though Harry could feel his arm supporting it, the sight gave him the creeps. The restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over the rope, which separated these books from the rest of the library, he held up his lamp to read the titles. They didn't tell him much. The appealing faded gold letters spelled words in languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain on it that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it. Maybe not. But he thought a faint whispering was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there that shouldn't be. He had to start somewhere. Setting the lamp down carefully on the floor, he looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting looking book. A large black and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty because it was very heavy and balancing it, balancing it on his knee let it fall open. Now think about if you weren't researching something in the library and you had no idea where to start, how would you go about finding the books? So make the connection with Harry. Would you do the same thing and just look for something like me? Um, you might judge the book by its cover. And I know that's a term we don't use when we talk about um, humans, but I am one that if the book looks pretty, it will get my eye more. Or would you have a set system of how you would go through every single book? So he pulled it out with difficulty because it was very heavy and balancing it on his knee, let it fall open. A piercing, blood-curdling shriek split the silence. The book was screaming. Harry snapped it shut with the shriek, but the shriek went on and on, one high, unbroken, ear-splitting noise. He stumbled backward and knocked over his lamp, which went out at once. Panicking, he heard footsteps he heard footsteps coming down the corridor outside. Stuffing the shrieking book back on the shelf, he ran for it. He passed Filch almost in the doorway. Filch's pale, wild eyes looked straight through him and Harry slipped under Filch's outstretched arm and streaked off up the corridor, the book shrieks still ringing in his ears. He came to a sudden halt in front of a tall suit of armour. He had been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid attention to where he was going. Perhaps because it was dark, he didn't recognise where he was at all. There was, a there was a suit of armour near the kitchens, he knew, but he must be five floors above there. You asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night, and somebody's been in the library, restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain out of his face. Wherever he was, Filch must know a shortcut because his soft, greasy voice was getting nearer, and to his horror, it was Snape who replied, The restricted section? Well, they can't be far. We will catch them. Harry stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came around the corner ahead. They couldn't see him, of course, but it was a narrow corridor, and if they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him. The cloak didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could, a door stood ajar to his left. It was his only hope. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying not to move. And to his relief, he managed to get inside the room without them noticing anything. They walked straight past Harry. They walked straight past and Harry leant against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. They had been close, very close. It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he had hidden in. It looked like a disused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled against the walls and there was an upturned waste paper basket, but propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look as if it belonged there. Something that looked as if someone had just put it there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, as high as the ceiling with an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved around this top Erised stra eru oit ub kafru oit on wozi. So remember, 
Forgive me if I've pronounced that incorrectly. His panic fading now that there was no sound of Filch and Snape, Harry moved nearer to the mirror, wanting to look at it, him wanting to look at it himself, but seeing no reflection again. He stepped in front of it. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself screaming. He whirled around. His heart was pounding far more furiously than when the book had screamed, for he had not only seen himself in the mirror, but a whole crowd of people standing right beside him. But the room was empty. Breathing very fast, he turned slowly back to the mirror. There, there he was, reflected in it, white and scared looking, and there, reflected behind him, were at least ten others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but still, no one was there, or were they all invisible too? Was he, in fact in, was he in fact in a room full of invisible people and this mirror's trick was that it reflected them invisible or not? He looked into the mirror again. A woman standing right behind his reflection was smiling at him and waving. He reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he'd touch her. Their reflections were so close together, but he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes. Her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, exactly the same shape. But then he noticed that she was crying, smiling but crying at the same time. The tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arms around her. He wore glasses and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up at the back just like Harry's did. And we will pause for me to start again for part three.